All right, folks, uh, let's uh, begin our, um, our second service. Let's sing, We're Marching to Zion. I think it's as fitting, you know, of, of um, uh, things going on in the world. We know that the Lord will soon come. So we're marching to Zion. Alright. Okay. We're marching. Come we. Alright. That's the first. That's the first. Alright. Alright. And. Come we. That love the Lord.
Jesus. Let's sing more about Jesus. So after the service uh, this morning, um, there is the shower for um, Ben and Priscilla. So uh, the church that is a church shower, so you are invited to stay and partake of that. So that will be following the service uh, this morning. If you take your Bibles and turn with me to Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17 this morning. And this morning, I want to consider God our banner. So I know we've uh, gone through a few of the names of God. So I'm going to do a recap and see if you guys can remember. We learned about Jehovah Rapha. Does anyone remember what Jehovah Rapha means? God our healer. And we looked at how God is our healer. And then we consider Jehovah Jireh. Provider. God our provider. And then we consider Jehovah Shalom, God our peace. And this morning we're going to consider God our banner here in Exodus 17. And this is such a great passage of scripture. And I honestly, I could probably spend a lot of time just like going through this passage. But there's so much that we can learn from this. So uh, I'm going to try to stay on time. I don't have my phone because it's live stream. I usually have a big time or so. I'm like going way off in time. It's kind of like try to get my attention a bit, but uh, Exodus chapter 17, and we're going to read verses uh, 8 to 16 this morning. The Bible says, then Amalek, then came Amalek and fought with Israel and Rephidim. 
And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men, and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him, and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. For he said, Because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So we see here Jehovah Nisi, or God our provider. And this is the idea of glorying in God's victory. Glorying in who God is, glorying in what God has done, and glorying, as we will see, in what God will continue to do. So in this point in Exodus, the children of Israel had left Egypt already. There was already the great Exodus. And they had escaped the army of the Egyptians and crossed the Red Sea. But now in this time, as they're uh, traveling, in their moment of freedom, they realize very quickly that because they are God's children, that they have enemies. And war comes and finds the Israelites. But as we read and focus in this passage, or, or read in this passage, the focus isn't upon the war that happened, but rather the focus is upon the victory and who won it. Victory against the enemies of life comes from God alone. And that's the idea of God, our banner, the banner that we are raising, the banner that we're lifting up. It's not so much something that you're representing. Well, I'm going to represent this team. I'm going to re represent that person. But the idea of celebrating and holding up that banner of someone who's already won victory. So the idea of in 1 Samuel when uh, Saul and David came back from fighting the Philistines and the women came out to the streets. And what did they do? They celebrated Saul and David. They said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. It was a celebration and a time of victory. But here the focus is on God, the one who brings us victory. So I'm just going to kind of break down these verses that we went through, starting in verse 8. Then Amalek, then came Amalek and fought with Israel and Rephidim. So the Amalekites attacked Israel while they were, while they were camped in Rephidim. And you say, well, what, what provoked the Amalekites to come and attack Israel. You know, they just had, they had just left uh, Egypt. But the Amalekites, and we'll look a little bit at them, they were a people who dwelled in the desert. There were nomadic people that would travel around. And they lived just south of the promised land of Canaan, which is where the Egypt or where the Israelites were trying to make their way to. And if you remember back in Exodus at the beginning, when you looked at Israel in the land of Egypt, their, their population was growing so mightily, and God was allowing them to increase at such a rate that it became a threat to Pharaoh because of their numbers. And he was worried because with the size of the nation, they could actually overthrow Egypt. So this Exodus that happened as the Israelites left Egypt wasn't a small escape of a few people, but rather it was upwards of two to three million people had left Egypt. So the Amalekites, although they're traveling around, this such large moving of two to three million people, word would have traveled around and they would have understood what was happening and knew that this group of people was coming. But to reach Canaan, this large mass 
of the Israelites, they would have to travel maybe through where the Amalekites were or maybe close to it. So if you remember the threat that was to Pharaoh, the Amalekites had that same um, worry is that what was this group of people going to, the, going to do? They didn't know what Israel's intentions were. And we see that the Amalekites actually launch a surprise attack on the Israelites. And this attack wasn't something that was warranted, but rather we see it kind of shows the characters of the Amalekites and how cruel and savage they were. If you were to read in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 17, it gives you a picture of this attack. It says, Remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way, when ye were come forth out of Egypt, how he met thee by the way, and smote the hindmost of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee, when thou was faint and weary, and he feared not God. So we see that this attack happened. They came up behind the Israelites and they actually attacked from the back and they killed the handicapped. They attacked the helpless and the weak and the feeble. And they, anyone who is lagging behind is who these Amalekites attacked and they slaughtered them and they left none of them alive. So this attack was cruel because it was against these helpless, but as well, the attack was against the civilians. This nation of Israel, as they're traveling, they weren't a traveling group of a large army looking to conquer. They were a people going to God's land that he had promised to them. They were civilians marching, and this army came and attacked them unprovoked. You know, the leaders, the Amalekites, could have gone or sent in officials to say, Hey, what is your plan? What are you guys doing? Kind of get a reading on what the Israelites were doing, but instead they decided to attack these civilians to attack this nation. And the idea of the Amalekites was that they would annihilate the Israelites. They want to exterminate these Jewish people. And this was the same drive that was behind many of these other nations because they wanted to take down God's chosen people. In Psalm chapter 83, verse four and seven, the Bible says, they have, they, uh, they have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. And these are the people that were involved in that, Gebel and Ammon and Amalek, the Philistines with the inhabitants of Tyre. So these different nations wanted to see the annihilation of the Israelites. But we see even further back who these Amalekites were. The Amalekites were descendants of Esau. So they should have known the promised land of Canaan to Israel. Israel. They should have known what God had promised to them. So because the Amalekites were the descendants of Esau, and God had given the promise of the promised land to Jacob and his descendants, Esau knew about this promise, and he, his children would have known about this. And um, Amalek was actually the grandson of Esau. So these... Amalekites, these distant cousins of the Israelites, knew about Israel's promised land and where they were trying to go. And instead of reaching out and saying, hey, are you guys here to take us over? Are you here to cause harm? They sent out an attack against God's chosen people. So these Amalekites, they were a wicked and godless people. In fact, in Hebrews, they're described in the New Testament. In Hebrews 12, verse 16, it says, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau. It's describing Esau, for, uh, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. So Esau is described as a profane person. And if you're the study that word profane, it's the Greek word bebelos, which means godless. So he's saying Esau was a godless person. And that same word, Bebelos, is used throughout the New Testament to describe ungodly or godless people. So Esau and his descendants, these Amalekites, were godless people. In fact, if you're the reading our passage, it says that they feared not. They attacked and they feared not uh, God. They were a wicked people who attacked God's chosen people. And the truth is, 
as believers today, this is the type of wickedness that we face today in our world. Maybe not physically from uh, people, but rooted, wickedness rooted in Satan. You know, the Israelites left the bondage of Egypt, but soon faced adversaries in their lives. And the same, uh, and we too, when we're saved, when we're free from the bondage of sin, we aren't promised a perfect, problem-free life, but in fact, we face Satan and his attacks daily. And the same tactics that the Amalekites use are the same rules Satan plays by. You know, these Amalekites came and attacked the weak and the weary, the tired, those who were, who were lagging behind, and attacked them without any mercy whatsoever. And the same is true with Satan in our lives. In 1 Peter 5, 8, the Bible says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. He isn't looking for a snack. He isn't looking for something. He's, this verse is saying, be sober sober be vigil vigilant be looking about don't be lagging behind like those israelites who are weak and feeble he's saying spiritually you have to be strong because satan is looking to devour and destroy those who are weak and falling behind lagging behind and not keeping up with the pack when we identify with jesus christ his enemies now become our enemies and we see the spiritual warfare that we enter now as believers. So we face the opposition of Satan. We, we face the opposition of all that goes on with the, what he's bringing about in our world. And he knows our weak point. He knows when we're not ready for an assault. And he comes in to attack and to destroy. But that is why God must be our banner. Why he is the one that our eyes must be fixed upon for our victory. Because victory is not in ourselves, but victory comes from God. So in our passage, if you look at verse number 9, it says, And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out. Fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Moses now appoints Joshua, and we're hearing about Joshua uh, already, to mobilize an army to defend this attack that's going on. So if you can imagine two to three million people, that's a large amount of people. So to mobilize troops that quickly, and remember, these weren't trained soldiers. It might have been something on Moses' mind where he's saying, hey, Joshua, we need to be prepared for things to happen. But we see that Joshua, already this great leader, was able to mobilize and stop the attack of the Amalekites who attacked from the back. But in this appointment of Joshua, telling Joshua to go out and fight, Moses says something. He says, I'm going to seek God. He promises, is, promises to intercede on behalf of Joshua and the soldiers. Joshua was to fight, but Moses says, I will pray to God. And Moses promised to go to the top of this hill that surrounded the battlefield and to lift up his arms and the rod, which if you're the study, you don't have time for that. If you're the study in the Old Testament, many of the people when they're praying would lift up arms, lift up hands to God in prayer. So Moses promised to go to this highest hill surrounding the battlefield, hold up this rod of God, which is a picture of God, and call out to God in prayer. This rod of God was looked upon as the banner of Israel. It was a sign of God. If you're the study back in Exodus 4 when uh, Moses is appointed to deliver the children of Israel from Egypt. And Moses says, they're not going to believe me that you appeared unto me. This is what Moses is saying to God. He says, no one's going to believe that you showed yourself to me. And then that's when God says, well, what is in your hand? And he says, this rod. And God gets them to throw the rod down and becomes a serpent and get it to pick it back up. And he says... And the rod in his hand, and God says that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath appeared unto you. So this rod became this picture of God, the power of God. It wasn't to show that Moses was this great person, but rather that God was using him. The same is true for you know, in Numbers when Moses made a serpent of brass. If you remember, the children of Israel had started complaining about 
uh, the situation and what they were in, and God sent serpents, fiery serpents, to go and bite and started killing the children of Israel. And they cried and said, we have sinned, and cried to Moses that, they would, that he would save them. And God told Moses to make a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. And this was a picture, we even see this in uh, John 3, that it was a picture of God and his salvation, to look and live. But that word, when it says that he lifted up a pole with a brass serpent, you know what that word is? Is Nisi, a banner. And that was a banner of God, that God would be lifted up, that God was the one that was going to save them, that God was the one that would bring them victory. So when they saw the rod of God on the day of this battle, their banner lifted high, they knew that God's servant Moses was crying out before God, that he was interceding on their behalf, and that they would be motivated, that they'd be emboldened to continue fighting because they knew that God was on their side. And that beyond their strength and beyond their skill, they had God's power and God's strength on their side. And they knew that God would give them the victory in this battle against the enemy. So Moses promised these warriors, says, you go out and fight, but I am going to pray for you. I'm going to intercede for you. And listen, when the enemies attack us, when we face these battles in our life, do you know what our hope is? It isn't us and ourselves going out to fight, but it is the God who is fighting and going before us and fighting for us and bringing us us victory we need to be interceding for one another we need to be praying and seeking god and his power and his strength verse number 10 it says so joshua did as moses had said to him and fought with amalek and moses aaron and her went up to the top of the hill so moses prayed while joshua and the army fought we need to be praying in our battles in life. You know, they may be spiritual battles that we're facing. It could be the battle of temptation, lust, lying, selfishness, cheating, immoral dilemmas that we face on a daily basis. We need to be seeking God for his strength. They could be physical attacks that we're facing. It could be that of ridicule or, or mockery that we might face in life. It could be persecution. It could be physical harm. You hear more and more about that. And if you're to actually take the time and look and research, that happens on a daily basis around the world to believers, that they're physically harmed or even killed for their faith. But whatever the attack is, our hope lies in God. Mm -hmm. We need to be calling upon him. And Moses did exactly what he promised he would do. He went to the top of the highest hill so that everyone could see him as he prayed to God. Verse 11, And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. So we see when Moses held up his hand in the rod of God, Israel prevailed, and when he let it down, Israel had to retreat and, and avoid the onslaught of the enemy. And God was trying to teach them something here. You know, this was the beginning of their journey as they entered into the, as they were seeking the promised land. And God was trying to teach them that victory is through the Lord and through the Lord alone. It didn't matter what Joshua and the army was doing on the ground, only that they were being faithful to the command. But we see that the victory was won through the Lord. And as God, or as Moses intercede upon their behalf, and as he stood on the top of that hill so that they could witness the power of prayer, that they could witness the intercession, that they could witness the crying out to God, that they could witness the seeking out or seeking God in all things, and that they could witness trusting God and his victory. Then we get to verse 12, but Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on or the one on the one side, and the one on or the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. 
So as Moses is up there and this fight is going on, he becomes physically weary. Because you know why? It wasn't in his strength. He was relying upon God's strength and he was physically weary. So they bring a stone for him to sit upon and to rest and to support himself. And this is a great picture of who our stone is, who our rock is, and the rest that we find in Jesus Christ. Where we can find support, we can find rest, we can find a foundation that we can rest upon. Psalm 94 and 22, But the Lord is my defense, and my God is the rock of my refuge. Listen, all of us here today, we face weariness. We face exhaustion and fatigue on a daily basis where we're physically tired. But do you know something? God is there for us to find rest. And we can find his support on a daily basis. And in our moments of need, we can find support in our rock, the rock of our salvation. And he is a rock that never fails, that can never uh, weary, that can never uh, fail to hold us up. And there's no boundaries to who he can help. But he's there to help us. Deuteronomy 33, 27, the eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms, and he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, destroy them. So here's Moses who is interceding on behalf of those who are fighting. But as he's praying, he himself needs help. He, he, he couldn't do it on his own. He needed others who can go up and help him. And that's where we see Aaron and Hur, who went up to help him. And we know Aaron was his brother. And Hur, um, some say that might have been his brother-in-law. It could have been Miriam's husband. So there are his two brothers up on that hill with Moses to support him. And when he became too tired to hold up the rod of God, the two men held up his arms for him. And they stayed right there with Moses all day until sunset. You know, when I look around this room and I see a church family, we have brothers and sisters in Christ who are meant to hold each other up, mm -hmm. to intercede for one another. And when we're interceding for one another, we become physically tired and weary. We can't go on. You know what we do? We come alongside one another and we hold each other up mm -hmm. and we point each other to Jesus Christ. And we say, he is our banner. He is the one who's going to bring us victory. You know, one prayer warrior isn't often enough. Mm -hmm. There's support in prayer that is needed from all of us. You know, others are needed when we're interceding on behalf of one another. When the enemy is attacking, when God's people are being threatened, we need to be praying for one another. We need to be holding one another up. We need to be supporting and encouraging one another in the Lord. You know, there are times when we and our loved ones, our friends, our church, when others believers need prayers. When they need times of crying out to God. And we need to be ready to pray. Maybe God lays somebody on your heart. You need to be ready to pray for that person. When Moses went up to the top of this hill, he didn't just go up there and say a prayer, a few words, and then walk away and turn around and go down to watch the fight. He stood there all day to the point of weariness. And I know that it isn't always uh, convenient in our lives, but the truth is, are we really dedicated to prayer, to interceding on behalf of one another, where we can say, you know what? I don't care how long I'm going to be on my knees, but I'm going to be pouring out my heart for one another. I know that brother is going through a difficult time. He's being attacked. He's facing a battle in his life. Or that sister is going through this issue. But I'm going to pray on their behalf. I'm going to intercede to God that he would bring victory in their life over the fiercest of enemies that we may face. And that's what Moses did. And we see that the victory was wrought not because of who he was, but because of who he prayed for, too. And victory was won. Verses 13 and 14. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Victory was brought. It was, it was won. 
And God tells Moses here, he says, write this for a memorial in a book. I want you to write this down. I don't want anyone to forget the victory that was brought here today. Because you know why? When we look back at past victories, we look back at past battles, we can say, God is her banner. He is the one who brought victory. It wasn't Moses. It wasn't Joshua. It wasn't um, her. It wasn't Aaron. It wasn't any of those. It was all God who brought the victory. And the same is true in our lives. We can look back at victories. We can look back at different battles that we face. And if we write those down and we say to our kids, we say to our friends, we say to brothers and sisters, we say, look, it wasn't me. It was God who brought a victory. We can have victory today, no matter what confronts us, mm -hmm. by God and his power, by calling upon the Lord for help. Praying for one another and allowing God to be the one who delivers us. To deliver us from the enemies that we face in our lives. And then that's when we see Moses, he builds this altar and calls the name of it Jehovah Nisi. They were to remember what God had done, who God was, that he was the one. The picture of that rod, that God was the one who was going to bring victory. But I want you to notice one last thing in verse number 16. It says, For he said, Because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. One of the things about God being our banner is that we can look ahead to how he will continue to win victories in our lives. This battle and this moment was won with Amalek. But God promises, he says, you know what? One day you will wipe out the Amalekites. I am going to destroy them for their wickedness, for who they are. But until then, he's saying, I'm going to be your banner. Moses is saying, God is our banner. He is the one who brought us victory now. Therefore, he'll be the one who brings us victory then. So we need to keep looking to him. You may be going through a battle today in your life. Or maybe you've gone through a battle in your life. Until we are face to face with Jesus one day in heaven, we'll face battles yeah. every day. We'll go through some harder than other times. But when God is our banner, he's the one that we can look back upon and say, look, he won a victory there. Therefore, I can trust him to win in this victory that I'm going to face now. Mm -hmm. Or that I'm in, in this very moment. The fight was won but it would continue Moses had lifted up this rod of God as a banner of Israel as a symbol of God of his power and Moses had cried out praying for God to give victory over the enemy that had attacked God's people the rod of God had been lifted up as this banner for what God continued to do that the Lord was present that he gave victory and that he'll continue to give victory so Moses declared that the banner of Israel the banner of God's people was the Lord himself he wasn't boasting in himself or his leadership skills or Joshua's great military strength it was all in God and if you're here today as a believer you need to decide who's going to be the banner of your life. Who are you going to lift up? Are you going to say, look at what I have done. Look at how much money I've made in the house that I've bought or the car that I drive. Those things aren't wrong. But if you're lifting God up, that's okay. We are lifting up God in all areas of our lives. So I'm going to finish with this verse. Speaking of this great military uh, power, Joshua Joshua 24, 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So let me ask you today, who, what banner are you raising up in your life today? Who's fighting your battles for you? Who is the strength in your life? I hope that God is your banner today. Let's pray.
Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we're grateful for who you are. We're grateful, grateful for how much you care for us, that you listen to our needs, that in the moments of our battles and as we face the fierce enemy, that you are there to fight and to bring us a victory. And Lord, I pray that each and every one of us who is here today in our lives, whatever we may be going through or we may face one day, Lord, I pray that you would be the banner of our life and that we would lift you up high. Lift you up high that we can intercede, that we can go to you to intercede on our behalf. Lift you on high so that you can be the power in our life, the strength that we need. But Lord, lift you up high that others may see, that others may know that you are the God of our lives, that you are the God of everyone, and that you care about them as well, and that you care about their soul, and you care about the battles that they're going through. And that they see the victory in our lives, that they would trust you for the victory of their lives as well. And Lord, I pray that you just help us to all to not forget that only you and you alone bring the victories that we see in our lives. Lord, help us not to forget this. Help us not to forget the victories that you've already won in our lives, that we'd write them down, that we'd share them, and that once again your name is lifted up, exalted, and glorified. And we pray these things in your son's precious name. Amen. So I want to thank you once again for being here today. Uh, I don't have any other announcements. I'm not sure about the details going on downstairs, but I'm sure they will let you know. So that is it. Thank you for being here. You are dismissed.